let me start from the top here. <laughs> Rick's shady. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, animation fans, and welcome to another Animate Podcast. I'm your host, Larry Vasquez. This is episode 31. Joining me is Rick Arroyo, and we have a great guest for you on this podcast. Rick, what's happening, big guy? Oh, man, this is going to be uh, an awesome podcast. We're going to have Richard Lico from Bungie talking about Destiny, and he's also going to be uh, speaking at uh, Montreal International Game Summit in November. So, I mean... It's yeah, I'm, I'm ready to do this. Oh, fantastic guest, great guy. He's been an instructor here at iAnimate, I think, since we kind of really started the uh, the games workshops. That's right. Uh, so he's got a lot to share, and we're looking forward to, to talking with him about that. Real quickly, here we just started a new block, and so we want to say congratulations to all the new students, returning students, and uh, welcome you. And let's get off to a great block here. Yeah, and good luck. Good luck, and if you're in Rick's class, you need <laughs> it. Yeah, if you're my class, uh, I'm coming for you. <laughs> you're going to need more than luck, all right. <laughs> the shadow of death is coming for you. Okay. There you go. All right, you got that nickname from your students, is that correct? Yes. Uh, if I remember correctly, Andrew Tran they officially gave me the nickname. All right. <laughs> which I think is a fantastic nickname. I love it. <laughs> awesome, man. All right, well, let's jump into the podcast. Hello guys. What's happening? Well, Larry, I never actually met you. I know, I know. It's been I've been wanting to get you in on a podcast, but your guys' uh, time before the game is shipped and stuff is a long time. So. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, and if I talked about it before now, they'd probably kill all of us. That's right. Yeah. So we don't <laughs> want that. But no, it's very nice to meet you, man. Yeah, good to meet you too, brother. All right, all right. How do we do this? It's going to just talk and have fun. Yeah. Well, that's the best thing to do, especially when you have some vodka. So. <laughs> nice. There at you go. Eight, eight o'clock at night. <laughs> <laughs> vodka knows no time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've right. never done a podcast before, so I'm just going to be all stupid yeah, here. Yeah. So you just yeah, yeah. Drive, drive away. Yeah. Just have fun. I'm, no bad words. <laughs> yeah, we try to keep it clean. Keep it clean. So I'm from Jersey. Do you know how hard that's going to be? <laughs> <laughs> all right i'll do my best i think you, you can do my classes, it man. right oh yeah, I'll, yeah. Be, I'll behave <laughs> oh, okay. well first of all we always love and appreciate our guest the time that you guys take to to join us um again we know you guys have a life you've got schedules and so anytime that you guys stop and uh chill with us for a bit to talk we really really appreciate it so thank you very much that was my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Very cool. So now we've got a huge, huge game uh, that we're going to get to talk about here, Destiny. Yeah. Uh-huh. Before we jump into that, let's jump into a little bit of uh, Mr. Lico here. I'd like to always hear kind of how you guys get into animation, and then we can kind of get to where you're at now. So if you can kind of maybe run down a little bit how you got into animation, what was the uh, driving force, uh, maybe some of your education along the way, and um, any uh, intriguing stories. Oh, cool. All right. So um, I actually didn't didn't plan on being an animator. Uh, it wasn't wasn't a goal of mine. When I was in when I was in sixth grade, I just I just wanted to make video games for a living. And I didn't care how I got in. I just that's what I wanted to do. And I told my sixth grade teacher and he said, no, don't do that. Just do your homework. <laughs> um, I didn't listen. So uh, uh, I went to school to Savannah College of Art and Design because I figured, well, you know, that's that's a good way. I, you know, I could draw pretty well. So why not? Right. I started with an illustration degree, and I realized that's not going to get me in. So I saw this movie called Toy Story, and I figured, wow, that looks, that looks pretty damn cool. I'm going to do animation instead. So uh, I graduated with um, a computer art degree. And- no. What, Rick? No, I didn't say nothing. <laughs> I got to be careful what I say. <laughs> <laughs> you can chime in anytime. You've been awfully quiet over yeah. there. I'm watching you guys. <laughs> I'm watching you guys. And, and we should ask... How did you learn how to animate? Because this is, I find it's a really interesting story. Like, what did you do to really pick up your animation skills? Everyone, because I mean, coming from school, you didn't, they didn't teach you how to animate, but how did you pick up your animation skills? Uh, it's just uh, playing a lot of Street Fighter. I was, <laughs> I was an addict. Uh, me and my friends would just, um, you know, it's college days, right? So we'd, we'd get a few beers and we'd go play Street Fighter in the evenings, and it was, uh, it was a religion to us. 
So I'd sit there when it was time for me to learn animation, and I'd just go through every frame of animation, and I'd count the frames, and I'd, I'd see where the hit happens, and I'd see a lot of their tricks. I mean, Chung Lee's got this, this um, heavy roundhouse kick that she does in Third Strike. We barely see the foot make contact, and it's all the follow-through pose. Yeah. And um, Hugo's got this crouching medium kick where the foot extends out, like makes his leg like super long for one frame, and then snaps it back, and you just see like this rubber effect to him. And I just just breaking it all down and seeing all of that and figuring out all their tricks. It just it made a lot of sense to me, and it just it just clicked one day, and I just just started animating at Sunstorm, and I'm like, wow, this this all makes sense now, and all those lessons I learned from watching Street Fighter. Um, and all that. <laughs> so I'm actually an animator secondary to being a game developer. Awesome. Okay. Now, real quick, before we kind of keep going there, what would you say the difference is between an animator and a game developer? Well, an animator is really concerned about their performance, and um, that's their top priority for them. Um, a game developer is more concerned about how everything feels when you're actually holding a controller and playing the game. Um I care more about the gameplay design than I do about any animation clip I'll ever make. And okay. I think that's what separates the two. So the animation is more secondary. That's You're going to adjust that based upon how it feels. Yeah, it's, it's, animation is just there to sell the gameplay, and that's all it is. Um, okay. it's, I mean, and a performance is still important, but uh, a great performance and bad gameplay is still a bad game. Okay. Now, how quickly were you able to jump into the industry then? Uh Pretty quickly. I mean, back, you guys might know, is that back in the 99, 2000 time frame, uh, if you knew how to press one button in Maya, you're pretty much hired. Um, <laughs> schools didn't teach game design back then, so there was really no candidate pool. So, you know, I made a little animated short about the plight of the bowling pin, because they're kind of screwed, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> like... I don't want to be a bowling pin having those big balls being thrown at me all day long. <laughs> so I figured I'd do a story from their point of view. And it was tragic. It was a, it was a sorrow tale. But it got me in. <laughs> and, it, uh, uh, you know, the employer, Sunstorm Interactive, my first company, was just thrilled to have somebody that knew anything about animation. And uh, I ended up animating on every project they had over two years, five games. It was crazy. It's pretty easy, though. Yeah. This this is where at? This was, uh, this was in... Indianapolis, Indiana. Okay. It was called Sunstorm Interactive, and I ended up working on Deer Hunter, Duke Nukem, Carnivores, and I shouldn't be talking about this stuff. It's not good. <laughs> <laughs> the games were not fantastic. It gave you a, it gave you a foundation, though, right? Yeah, no, it was, it was trial by fire, so it was it was a good experience for me. I got a lot out of it, but uh, I didn't get great games out of it. So. All right. Hey, that sometimes you kind of have to, like you said, kind of get thrown into the water and learn to swim there, and. Uh, really sink your teeth into to learn that way. So that's that's not a bad r route to go, at least back then, I'm sure. Yeah, I had never actually animated an entire human character. And then they hired me, and I'm like, crap, now i got to animate a human. <laughs> and I just I figured it out on my first day. And I'm like, yeah, no, I'm an old pro at this. Trust me, this is, this is how it works. And they just <laughs> fell for it. <laughs> I, just, I got to stay. There's no I animate back then, so. <laughs> no, no, there certainly wasn't. <laughs> So now, how quickly then after, shortly after that, did you, where'd you jump to next before you hooked up with Bungie? Uh, I went to Ravensoft. Um, it was a pretty good company. It was, uh, they're up in Madison, Wisconsin, um, and I loved it up there, but then again, I'm a fan of the snow, so that worked out well. Did um, X-Men Legends mm. and uh, Jedi Academy up there. Over. And, you know, both games turned out pretty good. It yeah, was yeah. a fun place to work. Crunch was insane, but it was, it was fun. Went to Monolith after that. And that was about 10 years ago I went to Monolith. And we did Condemn 1 and 2 there. And I was there for about three and a half years. And I was actually really happy at Monolith. I didn't want to leave. But when Bungie comes knocking on your door, you don't, you don't ignore it. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so I actually talked to them for about two years before I jumped ship. And I moved on over to Bungie. And, and what about the... Because um, I remember we talked about motion capture and how you picked up a lot from motion capture. I didn't start using motion capture until I was at Monolith. So my first time using motion capture was about 10 years ago. Um, so I, I had been in the industry for a while before I, I had touched that stuff. But uh, yeah, I, I, I learned a lot. Like when, you, when you're sitting there and, and you're looking at an actor's performance and you're, you're working on those mocap files and doing your art pass on top of them, um, you, you see so much. Like the way like a heel rolls or you know, how often the foot shifts or 
just the way that the hips work when the leg hits the ground and the subtle like buckling that the knee does as the foot touches really hard or uh, just so much great information in there. So mocap took me from being a decent animator to being a much better animator by, by just data mining all of that, by staring at it for days and days and years, actually. And we still use a ton of mocap, even at Bungie. It um, comes in very handy. Were you resistant to mocap at first, or did you just figure, hey, I'm, I'm, this is where I'm at, this is what we're using, and I'm just going to jump into it? Uh, well, we, we actually, they, they, they bought a mocap studio right before I left Ravensoft. And Ravensoft, unfortunately, believed it was a replacement for the animator, so we weren't really allowed to touch much of the data. So because of that experience, it was, it was kind of a, a negative for me. Mm-hmm. Um, but then when I got the job at Monolith, uh, uh, we could be the actor, so we didn't have to hire actors, which made, it, made me more invested in it because then I could go down and get my performance. Um, and then it, they used it as a tool. So one of the things that, that they taught me to do right off the bat was don't just use the mocap because if, if you just use the mocap, your game's our game is going to look just like everybody else's on the market, and there's really not going to be a style to it, right? So they said, just use it as a base. You could either pose rip it and keyframe your animation, you could use it as reference, or you could animate on top of it in a layer. Mm. But don't ever just slap it in the game, because you're really going to lose so much performance that way. And the moment they started teaching me that stuff and telling me how it all worked, it just, all of a sudden I started loving it. And now I actually use mocap whenever whenever I can. A little more freedom than having to feel constrained to it, huh? Yeah, you know, it's our job is, as animators, especially in the gaming industry, you've, you've got so so many animations to make to make a game work. And and anything that, that gets us good-looking data quickly, that's, that's a win. Mm. So then you got hooked up with Bungie here. Now... Um, they haven't fired me yet. Yeah. <laughs> now, you worked on Halo. Which, which game of it, the Halo series did you work on? Uh, Halo Reach. Okay, now where does that fall in line in regards to the the series? Yeah, that was uh, it was not part of the main canon. It was um, it didn't include the Master Chief. It was a, it was a story about the uh, Noble Six team or uh, the Noble team. Noble okay. Six is the player, and it was the dying planet of Reach, um, and it's it was like a backstory to the whole Halo franchise. And okay. Everyone knew that Reach was going to die, so it was a story about these Spartans trying to save it. But you know, we all knew that they were going to end up dead in the end so it was kind of the sad tale of the player trying to survive and there was this great last scene that uh, i shouldn't spoiler alert where um <laughs> the game's years old if you haven't played it by now this is, this is too bad <laughs> <laughs> it's a you're you're trying to you're it's like the last scene you've you've pretty much beaten the main part of the game um the pillar of autumn's taking off um and it's got the master chief in there and it's about to, you know, escape this dead, this planet that's dying from the invasion of, of the, the Covenant. And you have to fight this battle that just never ends. And eventually you're going to lose. But it's this great moment where it's you could see how long you hold out. And you can just keep surviving as long as you can. And it was so, so, like, emotionally involved for a lot of us. Like, just doing that fight was, was so really, really cool to, to get the player that invested in their character and, and sad about not surviving that battle. Kind of going out in glory, huh? Yeah, yeah. Now, this being your first game at Bungie, was it being not part of the series, um, was there less uh, stress on it in, re- in that regard? Or because it still had the Halo title, was it still just as heavy for you guys to work on such a game? It was even heavier. It was our last Halo game. We uh-huh. knew it. So uh, we wanted to go out with a bang. So we went with a more mature tone to it. Um, we added assassinations, um, and we really tried to to make it more modern, uh, bring it with a more current game design. Um, but we, we put our heart and soul into that, and that uh, that meant a lot to us. And it's actually, um, I don't know if you guys knew this, but the, it's free on Xbox Live Gold um, in September. I did not know that. Okay, so for all our podcast listeners. Yeah, go get it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All of our hard work for, for free, go for it. <laughs> 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 now, when you say modern gameplay, what does that mean? Well, you know, games evolve over time, and, and you know, uh, Halo is just like any other franchise, needs to keep up with the competition, and so we wanted to go with a little bit darker, a little bit grittier, um, but we kept it still Halo, so it was a, it was a good experience, and it, I think it helped advise where to go with the next games. Okay. So now comes Destiny. 
big, huge game here. Now, is this this is your guys' first kind of outing, at least since the Halo franchise, where it's been for multi-system, right? Yeah, yeah, first time on a PlayStation platform. Okay. Was that a good thing for you guys, kind of free you up or to make things difficult because now you're developing for two different systems, or, or how did that work for you? Uh, it was it's it's a very good thing. Uh, anytime you get a chance to branch out and try new things is is nothing but a good thing, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, Sony's been great to work with, and and Microsoft has has been really good to us. So we've got some great partners. Activision has been really good to us. Um, I, we've got no complaints. It's just been a pleasure doing all of this. Um, it's difficult making four platforms all work for launch day, mm-hmm. but we've got an amazing team, and they they pulled it out, and we're just thankful we've had this opportunity. Awesome. Now, what kind of game would you classify Destiny under? Uh, it's it's we call it a shared shared world shooter. Um, it's not the type of thing that I mean. It's combining so many different types of genres. It's really hard to classify. I mean, it's you've got first person shooter, and then you've got some some massively multiplayer elements to it, and then you've got the loot system, uh, and it's just it's it's hard to combine all of that and just cram it into one genre. Shared world shooter. That sounds good to me. I, I like that. The guys at work coined that one, so I'm going to stick with it. Yeah, I had a chance to check out some of the teaser trailers. What would you say would be, from the player's perspective, the most enjoyable portion of the game? I think everyone's going to find something different that they love about it. Um, we worked really hard in a lot of different areas, from story to the way the gameplay feels to the investment aspect of it. Um, I think what people are going to come and stick with, though, is is investing in their character and who they are. It's essentially an extension of their personality. So when you when you have that in a game, people are, are more apt to, to stay, to play, to invest in their character, to keep growing their character. And as the franchise moves on, we're going to provide more and more opportunities to continue to invest in your character. And I think that's going to mean a lot to a lot of people. All right. Another question. Okay. From an animator standpoint, your standpoint here, what was the most enjoyable part of working on this title? The supers. Definitely the supers. Okay. What, can you elaborate? Um, all right. So being a Street Fighter fan, these things were like just chocolate cake to me. I, mean, <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I had to have a guy jump up into the air and throw this gigantic fireball of space magic at enemies to blow them up. Space magic. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, you got people with arc blades doing ninja moves, and then you got, you know, the Fist of Havoc where you could pound the ground and everyone just flies up into the air, you know, disintegrating. It's just just so much creative opportunity in 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 those things. And being able to work with designers to not just make it look good, but to when you when you actually pull it off. You feel you feel really powerful by <laughs> by pulling those things off. You feel just like that. It's so satisfying, right? And I think that that satisfying feeling was for me being a, a game developer first and then an animator second. Like being able to merge those two, like that's the ultimate for me, right there. That's cool. How much of input did you, you know, someone like you have or animators have in some of those supers? A lot of input, actually. I know. Um, We've we've got a great design team, so it was pretty easy. They're very very easy to work with. So how it works is they usually come up with a with a concept of you know we we need an air an AOE an area of effect damage, um, and we need you know we need it to hit roughly frame twenty eighteen somewhere around there. And you know they give me these rough parameters, and then it's up to me to figure out what what that would look like. So what I usually do is you know I come up with five different poses that encompass what the entire move could be and that pose will tell you what has happened um, what will happen and generally how it would feel like it's it's difficult to make that all in one pose but once you get it all in one pose the rest of the animation flows so by by giving them about five different choices they could they could pick their favorite and then i could do a, a pose out for that and then when i do the pose out, i could just get it in game so i've got like say four key poses that describe the action the 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 super in general and they say well you know it feels pretty good doesn't feel very good and you know i i can affect timing like i could say well you know let's pull in the timing some and then i'll try that out and they may say ah push it back a little bit more and it's it's this great give and take relationship with them where we're all just working on this thing together and trying to get the feel right and if it, if it wasn't for animation's ability to come to the table with some gameplay knowledge 
And if it wasn't for design's ability to come to the table with some animation knowledge, I don't think it would have worked. Um, and then we've got a we've got a great art director who was there to to help make sure that whatever we came up with met the vision of the game. So a lot of times we'd be all satisfied with something. He'd be like, well, it totally doesn't work with the game. Let's try this other idea. And every time he did that, we ended up with something better than we had before. Do you find it difficult in that iteration process to be able to let go of some of the stuff that you've done as far as animation? Or is it something that you're feeling like, oh, no, this is a great idea. Let's run with it. <laughs> you know how many times over the years I've had to give up my animations? It's... Uh... <laughs> It's Rick can tell you it's it's the gaming industry. I mean, you're you're throwing darts at a wall uh, at at some point. You know, it's it's trying to figure out what feels good and you know trying to create fun is not something you can list or plan. So you know, it's, I got very used to it years ago, um, throwing down ten different animations and having one stick, and that's just the way it works. So I I expected it to work that way, and it, it played out exactly the way I had planned. And, it, and if something looks really good, I could always save it from a demo reel, you know? Nice. Okay. So you kind of know that going into animating, a, a, I don't want to say a shot, but um, what would you call that? Uh, a system. System. There you go. Okay. Thanks, yeah, Rick. that sounds good. <laughs> I'm still here. I'm just watching you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so you kind of know that going in animating a system that, hey, this may not stick. I'm going to run with this here, and I'm not going to get too attached to it. Yeah, it's it's the best way to do it. And I, I mean, there's still been a few animations that I've been like, it's really sad to see go. But uh, for the most part, um, if we work in a pose out um, where we're just doing step key poses and then we, we slam that into the game, uh, we're actually not even bringing an animation to completion. So it's really hard for us to get too attached to it because it's still in such another phase. By the time we, we make a decision, the, the edits are not throw it out type of edits they're more of just like oh you know change this timing three frames earlier stuff like that mm. so a lot of the throw outs are of, of earlier concepts they're usually out of the later things that we get to if we're doing it right that is okay now you said stepped key is that typically how you like to work or is that how it's pulled it into the the system the game engine at the time or oh it's uh the game engine just takes every frame as a tick and then it populates the engine with uh with those ticks um, but uh, I usually work in step key because it helps me understand the flow of the animation. Mm. And uh, a lot of the, the things I do is, uh, I can't do this at work, but at, at home when I'm animating, I'll show my wife a step key animation. And if she says, honey, that, look, that looks great, but what's wrong with your frame rate? Then I know I'm done, right? <laughs> so it's, it's a great test, and it, it really helps me figure out what the animation is going to be. And then I do a bunch of layers to add in detail and stuff after I get into my tween phase. All right. Now, what were some of the pros and cons now having to jump into a new system like the PS4 and the Xbox, uh, not 360, but um, One? One, yeah. Yeah, you're jumping now to a completely next gen. What were some of the pros and cons for you as an animator? Well, more memory on the PS4 and the Xbox uh, One. Uh, that's that's fantastic, although we haven't really got a chance to use it yet. But uh, it's there and we know it's coming. Um Plus the added fidelity and the graphics um, on the PS4 and the Xbox One, they really, really make the game feel a lot more immersive. Mm. Um, uh, the the downsides is we we had to do a lot of work on our engine to to make it work on a you know on multiple platforms. It's not something we had done in the past, you know, being Xbox 360 exclusive for so many years. So it was it was a lot of work, and and at first, you know, we didn't we didn't really have a lot of animation systems in in intact so testing animations early on was a bit difficult and iterating with design was a bit difficult but those were just really early really early issues that we managed to push past we got a really great engine up and running and and we're running with it so for the future that's that's really the benefit here is um right now we're tied to the 360 and the, the ps3's memory buckets because we need to ship on all four systems um, but in the future maybe one day we might you know be exclusive to next gen um, and I'm looking forward to if and when that happens, because then our memory bucket's pretty much times eight. So we can fit a lot more animation in there. We can compress a lot less. Um, we can just go crazy, adding tons and tons of things that um, we weren't able to do before. So now you said this was for the Xbox 360 as well? Yeah, it's all for, for four systems, PS3, 4, Xbox 360, and Xbone. Oh, okay, okay. I thought it was just next gen. Okay, so now you're kind of having to, to a certain degree, um, 
I don't want to say cap the game, but you know there's some limitations because you're having to uh, meet it for another for a previous system here. Were there certain things that you knew that you wanted to do extra that just aren't going to make it into the game, or you're going to add later for the next gen systems or current? Yeah, current, yeah. Current... there's well, that's, you know when you're when you're making a game that has to ship on both the previous gen and the next gen, you you have to you have to aim at the the system the lowest common denominator, right? Um, so we didn't really have a way to split the way animations worked between PS4 and, and, and PS3 or 360 and Xbox One. Um, in the future, we're, we're definitely going to figure out ways to to make the animation unique for both. Um, a lot of things like um, robust transition systems and whatnot, uh, um, for many reasons, was, was difficult to do um, this time around. Um, but we're hoping that, you know, once we have that added, added memory and added processing power, we'll be at, able to add more animated layers. We'll be able to add lots of transitions and, and all these things that help really ground a character and, and, and bring out that robust performance. Uh, but that's that's a ways down the road for us. You said robust transition system. What does that mean? Well, you, you know when a character stops running and then starts running in a different direction? Mm-hmm. Uh, the way most games just handle that is they either put in one simple clip to describe that, or they just let the character blend between run right and run left. Um, And right now, uh, we are pretty much just letting it blend. Um, We're doing that for many reasons, primarily because we're a network game where you you, you as a player are playing with your friends against a bunch of enemies, and it's all over the Internet, so we have to deal with latency and all that kind of stuff. So um, making sure that the AI was able to trigger a proper transition within a, a given time frame and make sure they're, they're in the right spot it became a very difficult challenge for us to, to overcome. Plus, there's a, a memory issue where if we have all of these um, enemies with uh, all of these transitions to describe going from front to back, front to right, right to back, right to front, you know, and it could just, it just grows exponentially. Um, that's a lot of memory to describe simple things like moving between directions mm. um, or to and from an idol. So we prioritized uh, making sure that the combatants were fun to fight. We prioritized making sure that um, the player knew where they were going to be, knew how they'd move, um, making sure that they had lots of abilities that they could do. We gave the player a lot more abilities that he can do, and we really invested in the the more important aspects to us right now. Um, Because a lot of those transitions, I mean, you could ship without them, and it's it's still a, a fantastic game. And it's a goal for the future, right? And I think a lot of game developers right now not just us, are thinking about things like this. They're, they're really trying to figure out, okay, we've got all this memory, we've, we've got all this processing power, how are we going to use it? Mm-hmm. And I, I guarantee you, anyone who's, who's dealing with this topic right now will probably tell you exactly the same thing I'm telling you now, which is add more samples and, and add more layers. Um, and it, that's definitely the future. That's what the next gen is going to bring us. So, And that just helps in regards to the fluidity of the animation and, and really keeps the gamer immersed in the believability of what they're playing. Yeah, it, when you have all of those extra samples and you have all of the, all of those extra layers, I mean you just it yeah, it, it really does ground the character more. It makes them it makes them seem more a part of the world and it, and it doesn't take you out as much. Now, does that mean and I mean this in a good way, does that mean more work for you as an animator? Yeah, that's fantastic. I love it. Yeah, okay. it does. <laughs> I also also something I think that um, you can mention is that with that possibility, you can add more personalities, you know, changing the stance, changing the speed of a, of a run or how they run, if they're running hurt or, you know, yep, exactly. with different weapons, showing the weight of a weapon just with, within the layers itself. So that adds a lot of creativity for, especially for a studio like Bungie. Yeah, it, it, and you nailed it on the head right there. We're actually doing a little bit of that right now. Like if you uh, if you look at the Devil Walker, that, that spider tanky type thing, um, when when it gets low on health, we actually blend in um, a pain layer, so it's it's a duplicate animation set that um, makes him look wounded, and we scale out the animation to match the amount of damage that he has, and start blending on the amount of uh, damage animation that plays. Oh, that's cool. So, in the future, we can do that way more often, not just with these big, you know, huge characters where you, it's obvious that we're doing it. And what's what's also cool is it's not just on the character's state like of health but also we could change an animation if it's um meeting a different character so example if you're the you know you meet this big giant character you can show 
on a character within a layer that he might be intimidated. I mean, there's still much work to be done, but there is the the options to impose certain uh, reactions on characters. Yeah, definitely. So it's just going with the with the addition of more memory and things of that nature in, in a new system. It just allows to for an animated reel kind of go a little deeper and deeper and deeper in regards to who this character is. Yeah, exactly. And okay. how each studio uses it is is up to them. But it's it's a it's a brand new opportunity for us to all explore ideas and figure out how best to leverage all that additional processing and memory. What are you most enjoying about animating? animating in the, in the gaming industry uh, right now? Um, well, me being a gameplay guy, um, I get to help craft the end performance. You know, the, when the player has that controller in his hand, I get to really influence how that feels. Because um, if you have animations that um, work with the gameplay systems, you, you could end up having a game that just is so much fun to play. And, and that's just, that's my be all end all. That's what I love about this industry. Um, but also it, it's a lot freer. Uh, I know that with film, you, you know, you're, you're issued a shot and then you, you work directly with the director or with the senior animator in charge of the shot. And, you know, you have to really craft to a lot of their direction notes, right? And you only get to work on that one shot in what days, weeks, um, in, in the video game world, it's a lot more free form. Uh, I'm doing, you know, a lot of our guys are doing, uh, multiple animations in one day um, and we are pretty much our own quality control with it I mean granted the art director and the animation leads we're all going to have a, a chance to critique the animations but we do rely a lot on our animators to make good decisions and to make them in the best interest of the pillars of the game and, and we've got a fantastic team that happens to do that and and I'm so thankful to have them all um, and I think that's what makes Bungie so so special um, but it it's it's common to the gaming industry of, of that empowerment, that that ability to to be heard and and to show your ideas in a way that uh, some other industries don't let you do. Right, and we had uh, Christian Zanzuk on our podcast last, and that, I think that was kind of the neat part in regards to these podcasts where we have different guys like you who work in the gaming industry or guys in the feature film because they're able to give kind of their background, and I think for the listeners it gives them kind of an opportunity to kind of see maybe the different, uh, the fields that they might be more apt to enjoy, you know, um, yeah. someone may hear what you just said in regards to the feature film or cinematics and go, no, I like that. Or someone else might hear this and go, no, I like what he's talking about here. I, I like, I would like to be able to be more collaborative in working with different disciplines. And so I think that's kind of one of the neat parts about having guys like you and the diversity that we've had in our guests to kind of be able to really give what it it's like to work in these different fields of animation. Yeah, it's well well put. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't mean to be dog and film there. I just No, uh... no, 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 not at all. <laughs> no, not at all. I think it's just a neat opportunity though because that's why I asked, what is it that you're enjoying? You obviously are in this yeah. field. You've been in this field for a while. What is it that you go this is why I enjoy being here? Um anything else that you'd like to be able to talk with us in regards to Destiny? Any thing that was unique to this game, you know, having worked, you, you, I was reading your bio, you've been in the industry, you know, since 1999, I think it was. And so you've been in here for a while. What was y unique with this game here? It's, uh, I've never worked on a game that's so big. Uh, it's, it's been four years I've been working on this game. And, uh, I was, I was the first animator on the project, which I'm thankful for. It was, a. Uh, during the day, I'd work on Destiny, and then in the evenings, I'd go and help close out Reach um, during crunch hours. And being able to work on Destiny from that early on and be such a part of, of, of how these characters move and a lot of uh, what the decisions were that got us to where we are now. And it's, it's such a, this large game, and we've, we've invested so much of ourselves into this game. Uh, I know that the entire team uh, has put in... Lots of hours and very, very passionate people trying to get this this game to be as, as good as possible. And it's it's really our pride and joy. Like we never before have I worked on a game where we've invested so much of who we are and, and what we love into something. And I I play the game with the guys every now and then at work and uh, I, they destroy me. Because uh, I, I, I'm not very good at it. But, <laughs> He's just but, uh, being modest. He's just like, I'm going to let them win. 
Oh, because I don't want to hurt anyone's ego. <laughs> and, and all the animators on my team were saying, "No, yeah, he is not very good, actually. He's right." You know. <laughs> um, it's just playing it is so much fun, and it, it I've never had that sense of justification before the way I have now. And after four years of working on it and putting so much of myself into it, it's it's good to see it turn out the the way we wanted it to, and, and we're all very proud of it. Now, what is your title there at Bungie? Well, during Destiny, I was senior art lead for animation, um, and recently I've moved into a new role that's principal animator, and that's the role I'll be in for the next few games. What's the difference? Well, senior art lead is is a is a lead, right? Um, we have another animation lead, uh, Bill O'Brien, that works works with us, and uh, he's phenomenal. He's a fantastic lead. Um, he he started learning the leadership role uh, towards the end of Halo Reach and uh, has grown into this fantastic lead over the course of Destiny. But um, having two leads meant that we had um, our schedules covered. We had to make sure that you know we had the right schedule in place. We had to make sure that people were on task. We had to make sure that um, the models were lining up with the goals of animation and, and design was on the same page with us. And it's so much high-level management and not as much just getting in and getting your hands dirty with the animation. Mm-hmm. Um, so recently I've just, uh, I've, I felt that it was in my best interest to let Bill, um, take over everything. Um, so there's only one, uh, leadership voice coming to the animation team, which clarifies a lot of critiques and whatnot, but it also allows me to, to focus more on being an animator again and, and working directly on the game. Cause my favorite part of working on destiny was, was working on the supers and working on the player and making the player feel really good when you play the game. And, uh, uh, you know, I've been a lead for, for about a decade now, coming up on about eight or nine years, actually. And uh, I'm ready to just make games again. Uh, the the, the high-level stuff is not as interesting to me as, as getting in and, and mixing it with the team and, and helping mentor guys and just focusing purely on the craft. Now, I've noticed uh, we had some videos for the um, Pixel Collaboration, I think it was. We have some clips on our website, as, and then we've also got the full-length ones for our members. I'm just kind of plugging that right now if anybody's interested in I animate. <laughs> 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 but um, I noticed in your lecture that you were also seem to be – and you can kind of help clarify this. And I want to use the term loosely or you can go with it as you please, but kind of technical. I noticed that you were able to – you set up controllers and, and nodes that kind of helped you in your animation. Can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, I'd love to. So uh, one of the things that that um, that I, I do at Bungie is is I, I help guide the animation technology, and I've uh, we've got a fantastic uh, rigging team uh, headed up by David Hunt and and Forrest Soderland. I'm sure I'm butchering your name, sorry. <laughs> um, but uh, over the years, I've helped um, work with them to get the rigging system we have, and it's it's this fantastic modular rigging system. Um, what that means is uh, we're not constrained by the setup of our rig. We can we can modify that rig in any way we want. Like if we could think about it, we can do it, um, and we can animate however we feel like animating. Um, essentially, what we do is we take a skeletal structure and we we apply the rig over on top of that by running a script, and then we set up that rig however we want. By you know we could put the arms in FK, we could put them in IK. We could make that IK handle relative to the hips, relative to world space, relative to the head or the gun if we wanted to. Uh, we, we're not constrained to anything. And as we animate, we can change it relative to parent space. We could convert it to FK. We could change the upper arm to be relative to his toe if we wanted to. Hmm. Like We can do so much uh, changing of the rig and so much altering that we actually never have to counter animate anymore. Hmm. And it, it frees us up to – like I, I actually – Physically could not work any other way anymore because I could, I could knock out a run cycle in about in two to three hours um, because I'm, I'm not counter animating. I'm focusing on the the core focal points of the body because when you when you actually look when you look at somebody walking around you, you're not looking at their neck or their abdomen. Um, you're looking at maybe their head, um, maybe their chest, maybe what their hips are doing. You're maybe checking out their feet because you're walking upstairs or something behind them. Um, so we animate our rigs with those key focal points in mind, and we dynamically solve a lot of things like the abdomen and the neck um, because it's, it's, you know, as long as it's doing the right thing, 
your animation performance is your focal points. It's not those secondary points. So like being able to just, just, just minimize everything down to a core set of keys that you need to animate with saves so much time, not counter animating, saves so much time. Um, and then using a lot of that information, like we have something called a runtime rig in our game engine, which solves our runtime playback. We actually don't solve anything on FK skeletons anymore. We solve it all in um, world uh, in focal point space. So the chest is relative to the world. The head is relative to the world. Um, actually, the head is relative to the look vector, but I, too technical. I'm going too deep there. But it's, <laughs> <laughs> this, I'm very passionate about this one. Um, we can actually take a run front, and we could turn it into a, a run right uh, with the press of a button. Uh, and it's all because our rigs are so freeform and modular. We don't reference in anything because we're not bound by our, you know, all the things that references introduce, not being able to change the rig in any way. We're not bound by any of that. We just apply the rig over a skeleton and we go with it. Like I said, I watched that from the Pixel Collab and it was very, very interesting. Now, how how much of that, um, and that's why I guess I was kind of getting at saying, I use the term technical loosely because... Um, those may just be kind of tricks that you've kind of been able to learn and and apply them. And you might call yourself, hey, no, look, I'm not that technical. Are you that technical? Is this something that you enjoy as well in regards to your animation? How does that work for you? Well, it's – it's uh, I, don't, I don't know if I'd call myself technical because if the guy – like the guys see how I script things and they, they'll get my scripts and then they'll just laugh their butts off. <laughs> uh, so, so from a – a coder perspective, I'm really not technical at all. But from okay. an animated perspective, I'm I'm super technical. Gotcha. Um, I, when I worked at Monolith, we didn't have a rig; we just had bones, and we had to figure out how to animate those bones. We had to create our own rigs. So um, I create rigs out of locators and dynamically applied parts of the body based on where I was animating at a given moment. And and I at first I was I was in hell. I hated it because I came from Character Studio, 3D Studio Max, where you have that rig all automatically made for you. Um, and then I realized, my God, I'm, I'm so much faster and I'm getting so much better results by not being constrained by one setting or another. And I could just change things however I want as I go. So now whenever I animate at home, I actually don't even use a rig. I just apply components. You know, I have scripts for the left arm, the right arm and IK and FK. And I just apply these different components and I just work on either the whole body or parts of the body using all these different contextual based components. Um, and then when I got to Bungie, one of the first things I did was I, me and David went out to coffee. We, we started talking about a lot of this kind of stuff. And then, you know, months later, we, we had a rigging system uh, in place that allowed us to do all of this. And it took a while. Uh, like the animation team at first, you know, it was new to them. Um, so they, it took a while to, to get in touch with it. But now I swear to God, these guys are, are so good with these tools. <laughs> and they seem to really love it. So uh, uh, we're, we're really proud of that workflow. That's cool. Now, do you talk about some of this in your workshops here at iAnimate? Yeah, yeah. I confuse the hell out of the students. With a lot. <laughs> 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 but yeah, I talk you... about changing the pivot points and center of mass. And, and, and <laughs> one, of the, one of the tricks we do at work is we evaluate where the center of mass is on a body, right? We press a button, and it tells you where the center of mass is, and it plots a soccer ball there. And then we can have that soccer ball actually control the character. So the character is relative to the soccer ball. This way you're controlling the center of mass directly. It's this cool tool that we've got. And I, I, I wrote it at home years and years ago. And I, I gave the code to the students. I'm so bad at, at writing scripts. And they ended up breaking the, the hell out of it. Like they, <laughs> they, they'd show me like videos of, of where like hands are flying off into space. <laughs> like heads are spinning around. And, uh. You broke my script. <laughs> so I, now I just give them the principles, what, what's behind it, and I let them write it. Now, how do you find that the students react to learning some of that kind of stuff? They enjoy it? Do they are they resistant? Or are they finding that like, hey, I'm seeing the benefit of this from what you're demonstrating? I want to I want to give it a shot here. They seem skeptical at first, and then what I do is um, I'll do a class where I just animate a run cycle or, or a melee animation or something in front of them. And I, I usually do it within the hour in the class. And then they see me using all those tools, and they, they see how how easy it all is once you know these tools. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, like it, it flips a light switch in their heads. And I know a, a few of my uh, my older students uh, were very uh, impressed with it, and they now try and do it at their companies. I know one of the guys at Ubisoft, another one's over at Crystal Dynamics, and mm -hmm. and uh, I still talk to them on a regular basis. And they, they say, "Man, you know, this helps so much, and it really helps 
make things easier at my job. And a lot of the guys don't know how to use it. And we have these reference rigs. But I put these locators over it and I just make it whatever I want it to be. And uh, it's, it's working out so well for them. Oh, that's cool. Very cool. It's, it's the Lico effect. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's just kind of one of the things I'm, I'm seeing, though. It's, you know, part of the reason why we have some of these additional workshops like the motion capture or rigging. These are kind of uh, supplemental workshops that are kind of adding to one's toolkit as an animator, you know. And so I'm just kind of seeing the benefits of stuff like this where, you know, someone who wants to go, I I, want to learn character animation. But adding some of this stuff on, it kind of just uh, is a little extra something you can pull out of your bag of tricks when you get into a bind, you know. Yeah, yeah, it is. And it, it actually simplifies things. I mean, it sounds complicated when you first see it all. But then when you really understand how it all works, it actually, it just, it makes everything actually easier. What have you been enjoying about teaching here at iAnimate? Well, iAnimate's a fantastic school, and I'm not just saying that because I'm on the podcast with you guys. I mean, I love you guys. You're awesome. (laughs) But you actually do have a fantastic school here. Um, The the students that you guys get and the the teachers that you have, like, uh, I've seen a lot of the reels of of some of the other professors, and I'm I'm super impressed with, with everybody's reel. Actually, Angie Jones was um, I read her Spicy Cricket book mm-hmm. back when I was in college, and uh, uh, she inspired me so much, and she's one of your professors. Yeah, yeah. So it's just fantastic having all of these uh, industry veterans and all of these really talented people being able to 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 talk to the students, and you guys don't stop me from showing them the locator stuff. So. <laughs> <laughs> it will never stop <laughs> That's what they're here for. They're here to learn, to grow, and so anything like that, in addition to what you already teach them, is a great advantage. Cool. Okay, so th- this is a good opportunity. I'm going to call Angie out here on this podcast, and we're going to make sure she hears it. We got to get her her in on this. Absolutely. We, have, we haven't had her yeah. in on a podcast yet, so uh, I've never spoken with her. No. Oh, okay. Well, we'll, we'll <laughs> change that in this podcast here. Yeah. She she has no idea. She inspired me and, and helped me become who I am. <laughs> I'm sure she'll appreciate that. <laughs> um, Rick, you got any other questions here? Um, I had uh, I, well, I had a lot of them I've been crossing out, but yeah, well, hold on. Um, yeah, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I do not understand your language, sir. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's like... Um, um, uh, I, I don't remember exactly when, but I, I visited, um, uh, Bungie and, uh, had, it, I mean, it's a fantastic studio. It's a really awesome place, but, uh, what do you think makes, uh, your studio so successful and, and, uh, you know, such a great place? Good question. Because nothing's ever good enough. Uh, I know we have, we have some seriously, uh, specific and talented people that are, constantly iterating, constantly trying to make the best performance possible, constantly trying to make the game better. We were we were picking at bugs down to the very last minute and the the triage team was was getting angry with everyone trying to stop, stop, you're gonna destabilize the game. We're like, no, one more fix. <laughs> <laughs> it's it, it's and it was all just noodly stuff. Like this foot wasn't lining up with the ground properly or something, right? So it's um, and it's not just the animation, it's so, the entire company is just so talented and so good at what they do, and and they're never satisfied. They, they just keep getting better and keep improving. How was it for this game kind of now venturing off from an exclusive title and now to this game here where it's going to go on multiple platforms? Um, what, what am I trying to get at here? That you weren't under, and I don't mean this in a negative way, but under the Microsoft hand where you're now kind of out more on your own is that a better way to say it is that yeah, more we, we, well I, yeah i mean it's we we're in charge of our own destiny now okay Pun intended. Had so many meetings i didn't even know i was going to do that that wasn't the plan <laughs> <laughs> um, we need so, a gong or something yeah. <laughs> 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 so how was that um, for you guys as a studio kind of venturing out did you guys feel comfortable and confident since you guys have had such great success or was this something even though with the success behind you and under your belt this was a new venture and a little bit um concerned i, I don't know well anytime you're just resting on your laurels you're not going to make a good game uh, mm-hmm. so we didn't do that uh, there was a lot of people um very panicked and very worried 
um, coming up with this new IP and branching out on our own. And and they 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 should have been, and it was a good thing. Okay. Um, we were able to make better decisions because we weren't resting on our laurels. I mean, being you know saying okay, we we made Halo. Uh, that's that's great. Um, but all of a sudden, it's 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 not what you've done. It's what what are you doing now, right? And we knew that. So so we knew we had to come to the table with something that people would love, but more importantly, something that that we would love. And we took it very seriously. We didn't we didn't mess around. Um, there was a bit of wandering at first, but it, that's all part in figuring out a new IP and figuring out where you're going and, and making sure you're making the right decisions. Um, so it was, uh, it's, it's good being independent and, and being in charge of ourselves. Um, and Activision is a fantastic partner and they've let us have a lot of autonomy. Um, so it's, it's actually, I, I have no complaints about how that all worked out. Very cool. I have a really quick question. Go for it. You, um, did you guys make Destiny for yourself, or did you made it for the audience? Both. I, I know uh, we made the game we wanted to play, and uh, we made sure that we kept the audience in mind uh, with making sure that they'd enjoy the game as well. Um, a lot of the, like if you take the, the PvP multiplayer, player gone player, um, a lot of the, the mechanics and the balance that came into that was actually from our uh, multiplayer team just every day at 4 p.m. just going at it, beating the hell out of each other. And um, it, it's they made the game that they liked, and it just translates into, okay, well, if we like it, chances are other people are going to like it. But we've also got the benefit of having a really good um, playtesting uh, setup so we can bring people in, get their opinions, find out what they like and what they don't like, find out where they deviate from us hardcore gamers, and, and make sure that everyone's covered. And I think we've done our best to try and, and cover all the, the areas and make sure that as many people as possible will like the game without losing um, a lot of what we love about it. Hmm. So why 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 didn't Bungie invite Larry and me to play the game? So okay, I, I, we, and I want we should tweet this. This is gonna get tweeted. Bungie, why didn't you invite Larry and Rick? They're gonna say Larry and Rick who? <laughs> Oh, totally intimidated by your wonder. And you came back. <laughs> mm. Okay, you were there, Rick. I know, but I mean, I, I didn't we... get I didn't get to play the game. Yeah, well, I wasn't thinking. I should have brought you down there. Actually, it would have been fun. I gotta give Bungie a hard time every now and then. Just, just... <laughs> don't let him rest on their laurels, right? No. <laughs> Okay, this is one of the things I'm always kind of curious. I ask this in some of the other podcasts too, and someone ask you. You mentioned this was a four-year project for you, but each movie or game or whatever it is, commercial, is new, it's different. What do you take, i.e. Richard Lico, from this project now to the next one? What was it? The big, some of the biggest things in your career now from this project that you learned and um, you're taking along with you? I think I'm at the point in my career where I'm I'm focusing on a lot of the subtleties of a performance. Um, when I first started this project, I looked at some of the early animation I'd done, and like I had these really long strides in a run. Um, it, it lacked some of the detail that that I'm a big fan of now, but it also lacked some of the really um, snappy, over-the-top performances that the supers we, we were able to nail. So personally, I, I feel like this whole process has made me a better gameplay designer and a, a better a better animator overall, being able to incorporate a lot more detail and, and really nail things like the stride of a run. Like, oh, I was so bad at that before. <laughs> and so many other little details. Like, it's 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 amazing, like, how... Like, I feel like I've leveled up. You know, the Final Fantasy music went off in the back of my head about two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and it's all thanks to this game. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Anything else before we close out that you want to share with us? Yeah, I should have my new my new demo reel out, so um, okay, uh, it should be coming out in the next month or two. Um, right. And you know, what I'd like to do is is you know, I'm the worst judge of my own work. So if you see it and you have some feedback for me, let me know. I mean, I'd love to see both of your perspectives on it and whoever else is listening. All right. Um, and hold, let me know other where guests. I need to go next. Say that again. Hmm? Let me know where I need to go next, you know? All right, all right. 
You said all who's listening to this. I said all our two other guests. So, <laughs> <laughs> Rick, you have two family yeah. members. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, hey, yeah, mom, my kids. Hey, mom, yeah, listen to this kids. one here. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we hang do this on. for fun. <laughs> I got one more question for you. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Because we're talking about family here. This is, actually goes back to my uh, question I had here. How do you? We're going to get real right now. Um, how do you, as a husband, a father, balance? family life uh, it's not easy um, you know working in the gaming industry you work you work long hours sometimes and uh, this project was no different we work some long hours at times and uh, uh, you just do your best you, you, you know, my wife is is really understanding she's she's a wonderful woman who who understands that you know this is my passion this is what I love to do and this is also why we um, can't eat dinner at night so <laughs> so she's she was patient with me, and then I, I made sure that I, I focused on my family whenever I could, and uh, um, tried not to overbook myself, which was a big thing. I learned a lot about this project, uh, making sure I don't overbook myself. Nice. Uh, nice. Family's not always going to be around forever, so no one, no one's ever been on their deathbed saying, "Man, I, I wish I spent another day at work." So making sure when you are home that you are home. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I got a newborn over in the next room. Ooh, uh, nice. Very cool. Congratulations. Thanks. Yep. Congrats. So making sure your mind's there, you're there with the family. Okay, good advice here. Well, Richard, we'd really appreciate your time on this. Congratulations on the release of this title, and we wish you great success on it. That's a, it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me, guys. All right. With that, yeah. we bid you adieu.